Welcome everybody to Money 911, where we talk about health, wealth, and peace of mind. And how much peace of mind is it when you know all your affairs are in order, right? All your debts are paid, everything's taken care of, and you have tax-free income for life, right? Well, we're gonna talk with our expert today, Adam Carroll. You heard all of the great things about him, but I'm excited to talk with him personally because we're in we're in a synergy already. We've been talking a little bit. We're already, we're really into financial literacy, and this is where we can really change the world and help people. Adam, it's such an honor to have you here. I'm really glad you should. Chris, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Just a couple of money nerds talking about uh, our favorite topic. This should be a blast. I know, I know. Who gets so excited about this, really? But, you know, in your TED Talks and your documentaries and things, you've really shared a lot of powerful insights on financial literacy and debt freedom. Tell me, what got you so passionate into this right zone, that topic, and what, yeah. what shaped that for you? It's a great question. I get the question a lot, Chris. What did I study? I must have studied finance or something in school. Yeah. I was a broadcasting major. Oh. I really, honestly, I thought I was going to be in front of the camera doing news or, or uh, you know, the Today Show is kind of like the golden goose right. that everyone wants to get to. And um, I graduated and realized that I was a debt statistic, that I had borrowed you know, my way through college. And my dad liked to call college my four-year break from reality. And I like to call it the longest and most expensive party I've ever been to. Uh, I had a great time. But when I got done, I realized that there was just a ton of debt to be paid off. And um, lucky for me, I met a wife, uh, met my wife my senior year in college. And she told me something that I'll never forget. She said, get rid of your debt or I'm going to get rid of you. And I was like, whoa, harsh. Yeah. And then we spent the first couple of years of our marriage blasting away debt and realized how easy it was. And then um, it, it occurred to me that no one was teaching it, particularly to high school or college students. So I thought, why not me? Why not now? And that that's really what got me started. And then the passion just was like a snowball building upon itself, I think. Just like you, when you realize freedom is not that far off, right? Uh, you want to go teach everyone you can about how to get it. Exactly, exactly. And it, and it the only problem's been that you know nobody's been taught. Like I said earlier, you go to school, you learn how to make money, you get yep. out of school, and what do you do? You give it to somebody else to gamble. Yeah. And it's like a roulette wheel. Is it going to be up or down when you retire? Because I've done it for thirty three years. I saw a lot of sad stories where they ended up on the down and they're retired and they're not going back to work. Right. It, it's sad. Some of the stories are sad. They're eating, you know, peanut butter and crackers, nothing wrong with peanut butter yeah. and crackers, but their lifestyle change. A hundred percent. And I think to, to your point, the, um, there is a great deal of uncertainty that doesn't yes. need to be there. Yes. Right. Yes. I mean, I think that if anything, if there's a message I want people to understand is that you do not have to go into retirement or your, your golden years with any level of uncertainty about what your, your lifestyle is going to be like, what you can afford. And, and if we can strip away that uncertainty and create certainty for people, I think we're, you know, we're doing the world a service. I think so. And I, and I didn't really realize how much debt everybody's in but our country's a great example of it right then you have the credit card and they just keep spending with no caps they don't like have any plan on how to pay it back and a lot of that is a that's another story which i think is intentional but the point is it's creating a lot of uncertainty for people it's mm -hmm. in the air right no Ooh, doubt so, right and and so the you know your shred method your fine tech company is, yes. is, is has an ex, exceptional speed of debt freedom. And, and that's something I am not a specialist in debt freedom. So I see a really great partnership because people would come in and, and I'm so shocked at how much debt they have. And then they think, well, I'll just, you know, pay my debt off and pay my house off or something. Right. Which right. some people talk about when yep. they get out of debt. But that's, then they don't have any money to invest in the tax-free income, right? That's right. So your your method really has helped a lot of people. 
we have hundreds of users. And one of my favorite things to do, Chris, is to tell stories of people who have yes, who have gone through our methodology, you know, changed their cash flow techniques, but then have built pretty massive income streams or or uh, built a, a massive body of wealth behind them because of it. Um, you know, the shred method itself is not new necessarily. This has been an idea or a concept that's been around for a long time. It originally started as an Australian mortgage is what how, how it was originally termed. And the reason for that was there was a bank in Australia called Macquarie Bank, and they would give their, their clients a mortgage, and then they would give them what they called a sweep account. And the sweep account was where their income would sweep through, but then it, it really functioned almost like a line of credit. So they could leverage some of that to sweep over and take care of their mortgage and um, what they found was that a, a, a lion's share of their clients were blasting away their mortgage in record time. Mm. And so we teach people how to use that methodology, but then to create massive, passive, permanent streams of income on the back of it, um, very much similar to what you teach in terms of cash flow for life and tax-free income you know, right. through retirement. So that's, that's, you know, and to me that that's a way for even people that don't have a lot of money to create money. And it's, it's yeah. a secret of the 1%. That's what I call it anyway, because, you know, a lot of high end people have these things and they stash chunks, lots of money in them. And, and there's, it's safe where you never lose your principal, but to get there, you've got to get out of debt. And yep. And now with the inflation and right and stagflate, you know, where we're at, yep. everybody's getting into debt and the rent's going up and, and all of those things. And now all the young people, they're struggling with the financial and debt and earlier in their lives. So what kind of advice for younger people would would you give to say at young adults? Yeah, I would say <clears throat> there's a there's a couple of fundamentals you know we would call them rules to play the game <clears throat> excuse me yeah these rules to play the game um you know one of which and i think this is central to what what helps people achieve wealth status or or any level of wealth in their life and that is that there the the spread between your income and your expenses needs to be as great as possible for as long as possible so there's two ways to to win that game and one is to increase your income and continually increase your income, which we hope everyone does. Um, but some are, are a little more intentional about that than others. So that might mean for a young person, it means getting really good at negotiating starting salaries early because your, your starting salaries determine what your future salaries are. So I would tell someone, get really good at negotiating and determining your own value when you go out and get a job. And then, and, and I would call that playing offense right? Offense is how much money you make, your income streams. And then I, you need to get really good at playing defense. And defense is not having over-the-top expenses. And, you know, as as any uh, good financial literacy person will tell you, and I'm sure, Chris, you would sing this from the rooftops, right. it's about fixed and variable expenses. Your fixed expenses are the same bills month after month. Mm -hmm. We want to keep those low, as low as we can. And your variable expenses are where most people get out of control. Right. It's dinners out, you know, right. uh, shopping sprees, late night, Amazon shopping binges. Mm -hmm. um, it's all those things where you get the stuff and then you go, I don't know why I got this or, well, this was a, a impulse purchase that I didn't really need. Right. We can limit that and really focus on building wealth over time. You can have everything you want in life. You just can't have it all when you're 22 and you may not be able to have it all when you're 32, Right. but certainly by 35 or 40, 42, 45, you should be in a situation where you can have pretty much everything you want in life if you've you know played the game by the rules, and you know how to navigate exactly. That's and that's a little um, exercise, and you guys can do this at home, where I t I tell people, okay, like you said, your discretionary and non discretionary, you know, keep track for a month, right? Yep. Add up the receipts, you'll find money, right? Yeah. Subscriptions that you've got that you don't <laughs> right. need, right? How many Starbucks did you drink? You know, all the going out, the new purse, all the stuff we do. It's amazing how much money, and I'm, it is amazing too, how much sneaks into the credit card, maybe not even yours. I find that a lot too. A lot of, what? I didn't buy that. Yes. So, And it, if you're it, not, 
Yeah. And if you're not on top, you're not paying attention. It's, right. I mean, how, how many hundreds or maybe even thousands of dollars are people probably like, oh, I, I didn't even notice. Yeah. You know? And it, I, right. There's a, there's a theory that we share with our users that lazy, lazy, idle money is dangerous money. Mm-hmm. You know, if you've got money in your checking account and you're walking through Costco right? and I've been there, I, I'm, I'm speaking of this because I know what I talk about, right. but it's like, oh, that's a cool kayak or yeah, yeah, right. yeah that I, well, I need that. I, would need that. I have $400. I could spend it on that. Why not? Right. Right. I, we need another TV in the house. You know, that's exactly what most people need. Yeah, right. And, and so that lazy idle money mm-hmm. in the shred methods perspective is if money is sitting in a checking or a savings account and it's there and it's, it's willing and ready to go somewhere, we're going to find a place for it. It may that's be Costco right. or Target or dining out or somewhere, mm-hmm. but what if that money were actually put to use and was continually in use? So you didn't really have the desire to spend it because it wasn't there. You just continually were building the ability to be more and more free, to create more and more passive income or more wealth to live on. Um, That's the goal. And we just have to make it the intentionality. And in that intention, you have to have, you have to bring it into reality because I know I just watch it inside myself when, you know, that, that bank account is really full you know, it allows you to think, oh, well, then I can go on that trip a little longer or, or whatever it is. But if you think of, you know, the funds are limited. And I grew up that way. You know, I'm, I'm a saver from the beginning. My daddy taught yeah. me, you know, and he'd match my money. And I was taught about that. Nobody's yes. taught about that. So it's such a gift. So I, I naturally think that way. I'd probably be one of those, you know, multimillionaires that takes stamps off of them. <laughs> you know, my parents are in the great, they came from the Great Depression, so that, you know, gets instilled. But, hey, yes. it's, it's going to be not too far from that in this situation that we're headed into. So people have to pay attention. And you've got a great documentary, Broke, Busted, and Disgusted. I could write a really good so- uh, theme song for you about that. For sure. <laughs> right. I write music in my spare time. I love it. But you share that in schools, high schools and colleges, yeah. and you've inspired young minds to take control of their financial futures. Tell me a few success stories from that. We've seen um, hundreds of students who've, you know, thousands, probably millions of students now have seen it across oh, the country. But we've, we've seen stories from hundreds of students who've said, I'm having conversations with my parents that I never would have had before about how much is saved, if any is saved, who's paying right. for college, how much college costs. And what what we found in doing the documentary, Chris, was that there is a lion's share of students who who inaccurately believe their parents are paying for college. Yeah. And the parents don't know that the students are assuming that. So they'll do the the loan documentation. They might take out a parent plus loan or uh, help the student sign up for a uh, for like a, a a government loan. What they don't have the conversation around is who is actually making the payment when the loans come due. Mm. And so this has caused rifts with families when the student graduates at twenty two or twenty three, loans come due, haven't maybe haven't been paid until they're twenty four or twenty five, and might be delinquent. Or I mean, it's it's a challenge, and so. The greatest success stories are the students who've said, I totally took this to heart. I applied for every scholarship possible, talked to my parents about how to minimize our student loan debt. And thanks to you or those conversations or the documentary, um, they're graduating with significantly less, 10 grand, 20 grand less in student loans. And as you know, a student starting out at 24, 25 that has zero debt is decades ahead of yep. someone that's coming out with 30 to 60 or hundred grand in loans. It's shocking. It shocks yeah. me. I have, you know, older people coming in to my office and they're still paying their student loan. And they never even thought about going in and renegotiating, which they can do say, okay, yes. I want to pay my loan, but I want, I can pay a little less. Right. And there's that negotiation yep. and with credit cards too, where they want that money. So you can negotiate and get a lower, right. So it's, this, I am, this is just so exciting to me, you know, the financial literacy, 
because you just people spend their whole life working for money and they have no idea that they're planting it in their garden where all the gophers are eating the roots and it's not going to blossom. The great right. metaphor. Right. It's a right. great metaphor. Right. Um, yeah, we're, we're trying to get people to plant more, but plant exactly. in ways that are, that's, that's either guaranteed income right, or, uh, certainly that we don't lose principle yes. and that we, um, we're protecting what we are planting for the rest of forever. I mean, that's exactly. really part of our goal. I, I heard someone say this and it resonated so much with me. I'd like to share it, that it's easier to make it than it is to keep it. And it's easier to keep it than it is to grow it. Mm -hmm. And if as a general rule, we're getting really good at making, keeping and growing, we'll probably be all right. Um, it, it, so it, wherever you are in your journey, you, as for your listeners, what do you need to get better at is one of the, you know, one of the questions I want you to ask yourself, is it making it, is it keeping it or is it growing it? That's really good. And very, very good because, and a lot of people think that they're only, see, they only know what they've been taught and, and it's a vagueness because you're not ta taught financial literacy in school. So yeah. what do you see on, you know, cable news is, you know, the, the stock market, that's like the only way that you can invest your money is risk. You got to risk your money to make money. That's the big line. And we're like, wait a minute. And when I first started out, you know, three decades ago and I lost money, that really bothered me. And I didn't really understand yeah. all of the story it was like, why am I losing my, I'm a financial planner. I'm not supposed to lose money. I took a year or two out of everything of selling because yeah. it really concerned me of like these are these people's estates i don't want to mess up here right 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 and i don't want to lose my money either so i that's when i learned about safe money and as you know I, w people that do safe money make less money i would make more money doing being you know stocks i make money totally. by holding your stock I make money moving your stock right i make money doing nothing and yeah, I would have made more money, but the way I think about it is I can meet my maker. I'm clear. I did the best that I could with what I got because that's that's what I live for and to give the best that I can and help folks. So that's why I'm so excited about what you do, because financial education is overlooked. And so how do we encourage schools? How do we how do yeah. we get this in there? I mean, you you've pioneered the way you're, you're ahead of me in that you've gotten into the schools, right? It was hard. It was really hard, Chris. When when we started uh, writing books and giving seminars, and this was back in 2004, so you know almost 20 years ago, um, it was right around the time of No Child Left Behind. And the school administrators were saying, I'm not giving up an hour of my day or my teacher's days for you to come in and talk about money of all things. <laughs> and we we really we we like tried to we knocked on hundreds of doors and the administrators all said the same thing nope it's pass and yet when we went to the college audience the college environment they said oh this is great because our students we know they're in debt we, it's kind of a dirty little secret we don't talk about it but right. we do want them to have less credit card debt we want them to have you know they need student loan debt to be here but but it would be good if they had less and what we were saying was listen, these students, if they don't know what to do with the debt that they're incurring, you won't qualify for to give out student loans at some point. And that was a big deal for universities because without student loans, they'd be sunk, right? I mean, they- Right, right. How much, how much would enrollment go down if there were no student loans at a certain university? And so in answer to your question, how do we bring this into schools? I think number one, we have to bring it home first. We have to have parents talking about it with their parent or with their kids. Um, that was really what my Ted talk was all about was how do you teach kids real life money management in an era where money is no longer real. And so if we can do that, if we can bring it to the kitchen table and talk about money with our kids um, in a way that they understand and they can appreciate, we'll go a long way towards fixing the next generation's relationship to money. It's so important, and and they're trying to change the mo the money model, so it's going to get even more confusing when things are going to go digital, right? That's very soon, and and you know the powers of the be are moving it all over the planet that way, and so the whole. But there's still going to be some baselines that are not going to change, right? 
and and that's that's what we we're we're holding on to because they they're age old and they're solid, but the bi big structures are crashing down. They're the no whole doubt. thing is right, no doubt. You know, any any time, and I think just as as an indicator of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned pre-interview, we just got back from a vacation and it was not really astonishing to me or surprising to me. I, I, I expected it to, to a certain extent, the number of places that won't accept cash anymore. Oh, I didn't. And, know that. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, when you're traveling, there are lots and lots of places that will say we don't accept cash as credit only, mm. um, or, or they'll say Apple pay or Google pay, or you can PayPal or Venmo. Mm. But what's fascinating about that is that you spend more, and this is an age old study that was done, uh, but the people spend more when they use plastic because That's it's right. not, it's not conscious how much you're spending. It's That's right. Money That's actually right. has a, you know, when you're handing over a, a $50 bill and I'm curious from your perspective, do you hold on to fifties and hundreds? Is that hard to break them? It's harder to break them. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. you don't want all the cash, and that's and, right. And and I'm in that con and I'm in a saver. Con I'm already in that saver consciousness. So yeah, you know, the stashing cash too, stashing totally. cash. But it, but then you know, there's a lot of things to mitigate here because you know, you know, the balance have some precious metals, right? Yep. And the value of the dollar and the bricks and the value of the dollar and yep. it's not the prime currency. And it, it's not going to happen like <clears throat> it's done, but it's moving that way. Yeah. So, so it's like a fluid kind of conversation that it you is. have. Um, and I used to say, you know, you should have six to eight month rainy day money. But after this last pandemic it was like, we should have one or two years. Right. And then now that it's shifting into, you know, where there are going to be places that it's, you know, they're good. They don't want cash. They're going to burn it up. You give it to them. They'll burn it up. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and cre creating the system of where they, we were, you know, you're graded on if you're a good person or not. It's we were near, we were near a point, I think, where oh you would have paid money to have money held in a bank account. Mm. I think we were, we were dangerously close to that, you know, where there's yeah. the negative interest rate essentially on your money that, we would like to get, and we are getting now in a high yield savings account, 4% or four and a half percent. People get excited about that. But imagine if, if the money that you held in those accounts, the lenders were saying, well, we're going to charge you to hold on to your money, you know, and keep, keep it safe. Quote right. Unquote. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I, I would agree with you on the, the liquid savings and what you've got out there. Mm -hmm. the, the one minor adjustment I make to that we do with our clients all the time is there is a difference between available money and accessible money. So, so money availability would be, I can go to the bank and I can pull it out or it's in a safe in my home and I can hold out, you know, it's tangible. Right. Um, accessible money might be money that you can access from time to time when you need it. It may not be immediately available, but you could get it within a day or two. Right. And I think there's, there's going to be a case that we could make for having buckets of accessible money. And that could be lines of credit. It could be money in a whole life insurance policy. It could be, right. uh, you know, equity you've got in other properties or assets, but having accessible money is important. Um, and, and just understanding that when you have money sitting on the sidelines, hopefully it's making some money, but in many cases, it's like a melting ice cube sitting on a counter. It is. Yeah, yeah, it is. And you have to offset that deflation or, the, you know, the lost value of that money because money is really just an instrument and it's the value, right. and it, but it's lost its value. And, and, you know, there's some gray areas that none of us really know because if, you know, at one point when there's no more money and you've got all your cash, you know, but nothing really, it's, it, you know, there's a lot of, there's a process that happens, but I think some things are going to happen really fast. Yeah. That's why my show used to be called Ready, Set, Retire. Okay. But when I re rebooted it in this last year, it's gone to Money 9-1 because of what we're talking about. Yeah. And right. I didn't really know, you know, I used to say, you know, think, well, I like, kind of like the last days or something. Now I'm like, it's so much later than I thought. It is moving so fast that. And so that's why it's so important that people take the time 
to learn about this and learn what to do. And I think it's good to have a little bit of precious metals, right? Yep. To have, yep. you know, the balance of all of those things. And and I'm I like the index universal life, right? It has a long term care in it now. It's like a hybrid sure. old life. And and so we're we're really similar. We've got a lot of really neat similarity, but you're you have really hit it with a you've gotten into the universities with your financial literacy and yeah. achieving remarkable debt freedom and building wealth is what people need to aspire to and so just so people can have some little practical tips maybe drop a few little jewels for people yeah. that they could get yeah. and go with so first the first jewel i'll drop is that um if if you do not have a home equity line of credit on your home, I would ask why not? That that at the very least is the first sort of emergency blanket, if you will, outside of the six to eight months or six to 12 months worth of living expenses. Um, secondarily, that's what we use as the shred tool. That is our that is our sweep account in the example of the Macquarie Bank is our, our income literally just flows through the line of credit. So the line of credit, uh, we borrow against it, we pay it down, we borrow against it, we pay it down all the time consistently. But when there's room on it, when we have money available to us, we're dropping that on either debts or putting that into investments constantly. Hmm. And the the secret behind all of that, Chris, is um, this is a reality that was taught to me years ago by a CPA. He said, we have two great expenses in our life. Number one is taxes. So we should always be trying to minimize our tax liability in a legal way. However, we can do that. We should be doing that. And the second greatest expense that any of us will ever have is the interest expense on debt. And namely what you're paying an in interest on student loans, on your mortgage, uh, you know, car loans, credit cards, et cetera. And so he said, if you can figure out how to minimize your taxes and minimize the interest expense on debt, then wealth is fairly a foregone conclusion, so long as your spending's in control. Because you'll always have more income than you do expenses. And then you figure out what to do with what's left over. And in your model, I would put it in safe money vehicles. Right? Right. How do we how do we pad future accounts to give us tax-free income at retirement? Um, which is exactly what my family and I do and what we'll continue doing for generations. I mean, we're talking about creating not just wealth for my wife and I, it's, or my kids, it's generational yes. time. Yes. And when we do that and we teach those longstanding principles of legacy and planning and, and, and uh, frugality might be in there, but certainly thrift and, and how to make more than you spend and all those kinds of things. We teach that to our, our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids. This thing goes on forever into perpetuity. Right. right. Um, so you know, the, the nuggets that I could share are wherever you are in your journey, know that the pursuit of mastery of money is, is like climbing a mountain that has no peak. Mm. So maybe you're in the foothills, maybe you haven't even found the trailhead yet, right. or maybe you're, you've summited or, or on the way to the summit. Um, wherever you are in the journey, keep learning, keep listening to shows like this, keep digging into more information and find someone who, who you appreciate the way they live. Right. And follow their advice because they're, you know, they're obviously doing things right. That's great, Adam. That's so good. I'm, I'm learning things. That's, that's really good. <laughs> you know, you're a renowned financial literacy expert. And what do you think when you, when you look at the future and, and there's a lot of trends and technologies, do you think all of these things are going to change the way we manage our money? I do. Uh, fundamentally, I do. I think that we have not really even begun to see what artificial intelligence will do in terms of uh, stock trading and and right. you know those kinds of things. Um, I think AI will play a significant part in how money is managed and saved and utilized, because I think there there will be a time in the not too distant future where you will get a. a you could get a summary from an, an artificial intelligence engine looking at your finances that says over the past 10 years, traditionally July or August has been an expensive month for you. So you may want to cut back on this because you're probably going to spend money in this, right. or it's going to say in the next three months, your property taxes come due. 
So just beware that the the extra 12% you're spending at Target may come back to bite you. You know what I mean? Right. So there's going to be some some rationality to how we're handling money based on what the AI engines tell us. Mm -hmm. And we could even tell our bank accounts, um, determine how much I'm going to spend on travel in the net or in the last 24 months, how much I've spent and begin setting up an account for me in the next 24 months of what that looks like for my upcoming trip. And our accounts will do that for us just based on AI. Right. Um, I think what it's going to do ultimately is it's going to change people's behavior in a way that is um is unconscious so we don't have right. to physically think about or consciously think about what we have to do the the engines that we're building will do it for us um, right right shred really does that the shred method is beginning that process we have not layered in ai yet but that's that's on our roadmap in the future it's on your roadmap okay yep. yeah i had another guest who's who's a, a partner or sponsor um i flip so they're the first AI software at that that literally you know scans and and says okay keep your money in cash now and yeah. and um the, I don't believe there's anybody else out there yet but it is an AI software that watches the market and 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 if you're conservative then it tells you how to invest conservatively for young people it sounded great you know but no doubt it's no uh, doubt where everything's going and it's the same system that brokers use but you're yep. paying all the fees for them <clears throat> excuse me to hold your money no doubt no doubt i think that will be the next wave of fintech you know the the companies that come along and will have some aspect of ai and i i would believe that the next generation whether it's uh certainly millennials gen z and maybe even more gen alpha um that are coming through school right now they're going to grow up with AI. Right. So they will have trust and faith in, in uh, a robo advisor of some sort. Mm -hmm. So there may be an opportunity for, um, you know, I think there will be, there will be fewer of the next generation that will look to advisors for advice and they'll focus on what the, right. you know, what the engines are telling them to do. What? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting world we live in, but we're still here and and i think there's a i like the consciousness part of it we're you know we're, we're applying ourselves still yes you know we still have agency and um so it, I, I think we could talk forever we'll, we'll just have to come back again you know i really enjoy talking with you and i just wanted to see if you had any parting words or cherry on the top you wanted to share with everybody Oh gosh, my parting words, my cherry on the top. Uh, nothing, you know, th there is a a statistic that was put out by the USDA that the average cost to raise a child from zero to eighteen right now is three hundred eighty five thousand dollars. What? Oh, yeah. And that's not including college costs. Ooh. And when I saw that number, and I look at my three dividends from my wife and I's merger, yeah, um, right. I look at them and I think that's a million oh. plus. And I could buy a really, I could buy an apartment complex, you right. know, for that amount of put, at least put a significant amount down. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so years ago, I, I took it upon myself, my wife and I both that we were going to raise our children to be very money savvy, that they would understand the costs that, that are incurred or accrued in raising kids, that they would take an active part in that. That's great. And that by the time they were 18, they could stand on their own two feet financially. Beautiful. And so I would, I would encourage all your listeners to begin teaching the next generation all about money, the money lessons, either you wish you had learned the, the, you know, the great money lessons you did learn, the, the hard lessons you learned, the mistakes you made, share all of that because young people are far more receptive than we give them credit for and want to know how to handle money. It's, it's yeah. going to be a really important thing for them to get. And for me, that's one of the things that I hope to leave future generations is I want, you know, young people or parents at some point to say, I heard Adam say something on a podcast or at an event, or I read one of his books and this is my takeaway. And this changed everything for the better. Um, and I think that's, that's it. One great well-placed conversation or a number of them over and over again can, can make a world of difference in a young person's life. That's it. And make a world of difference. And that to me 
is the real money. That's where I get my value when I've helped someone. I get to take that with me wherever it goes, wherever I go, and I don't have to worry about the crash. Or I mean, that's to me, that's what it's all about. And 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 I, and I've created a course called Create Income You'll Never Outlive. We're about to launch it, and and there, be 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 aware that there's some really neat things I can see coming for both of us here, and I'm really. I love it. Really, really excited that you that we got to share this podcast together. And everybody, tell them how they can get in contact with you for the Shred Method ex experience, right? Yes, yes. We And we love teaching people about the Shred Method. So if you go to theshredmethod.com, okay. there is a wealth of free information there. Uh, we have a master class. We have a number of articles, a number of podcasts that I've been on where I talk about it. Um, so if you are at all intrigued by the idea of creating more efficient income, taking your income and putting it to work for you where it, where it will do the most good, the shred method.com is the best place to go, Chris. All right. Very good, Adam. So much, so many good tips here. I really appreciate you and, and we'll look forward to more. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on and keep doing what you do. I, I'm excited about the course you're about to launch. All right. I think the name is amazing. And who doesn't want income they can't outlive? I mean, that's... I know. And tax-free. How about tax-free income? Brilliant. Even <laughs> more so. Right. Thank you, Adam. It's been a real joy. Thank you. There's so much to learn about healthy money. I hope today's discussion brings you one step closer to securing and protecting your future. So you can get started on the right foot, go to meetwithchrismeller.com and schedule your free financial fitness strategy session. Thank you for listening and please subscribe to Money 911 so you don't miss our next episode which includes health, wealth, and peace of mind.